Hi, I'm Susan Platt, and welcome to Platitudes, Find Your Roar. Today, I'm just so happy to be with my longtime friend, Kara Brown McCormick. We haven't physically seen each other in a good while, Kara, um, but we worked together nearly 25 years ago when she and her company, Smart Campaigns, were doing the research when I was Senator Chuck Robb's campaign manager against Oliver North in 1994. And of course, we all know we were successful in that race. Since then, Kara has gone off to bigger and better, including another old boss of mine, Joe Biden. John Kerry's presidential, and she has done research in, all across the country and for some really large initiatives as well. Um, she is also currently, which is really what's in the news right now, co-founder of Rent Choice Voting in Maine. And uh, we were lucky as Democrats to pick up a seat from having that Rent Choice Voting in Maine. I'm sure, I don't know that it will always happen that way, but I'm glad it did then. So, Kara, you're now married, you have two kids. Tell me how you yeah. find your roar. So I just first I want to say thank you, Susan, so much for having me. And I just want to acknowledge you for giving me my start in American <laughs> politics. And you've done this for so many women, Susan, and we are just blessed. So it's about 24 years ago that you were the second female campaign manager that I was lucky enough to work for. You were at the helm. You were leading and managing the biggest Senate race, the biggest U.S. Senate race in America. You demanded my excellence. <laughs> you taught me how to be creative. You taught me how to make decisions in the moment, or at least to watch you make decisions in the moment. Because, you know, you gave me this confidence, right? And that's really what I've carried with me, which is that it's okay to follow your gut instinct, and it's okay to trust your instincts. And that's what I carry with me today, and I am deeply grateful to you. Yeah, you taught me how to be effective. You taught me how to be fearless. Um, it, we, are, we are in a world, a very cutthroat world of politics, yeah. Susan. Yeah. It is a very male-dominated world of politics, and I watched you um, tell everyone what to do all around you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but this isn't. I, but this isn't about me. This is about you finding your role. Well, I, well I, I know, but but part of I mean, it's sort of special because part of how I found my roar was when I was a twenty-something-year-old, and you had me at your knee and trained me and taught me and you've done this for a lot of women and I just wanted to acknowledge you thank and you. thank you and I think that find your roar is a really cool thing because now what we both need to do and what all of women who work in politics need to do is to encourage other women who work in politics and don't work in politics to find their roar to learn how to be effective to learn how to trust their instincts it is our responsibility to make our democracy and our country and our states that we live in a better place. It is our job. It is so our responsibility. It's our job. It's our it's job. As much as my job as emptying the dishwasher and doing the laundry, the other thing that I do is I work on politics and I work on making our, our country and my state a better place. And so, um, you know, in Maine, we took a really, really big step this week forward with ranked choice voting. It was the nation's very first use of ranked choice voting in a general election for Congress. It was deployed for the very first time statewide in American history. And um, what it is for everybody who's watching... And that's you. That's you, honey. So proud of Well, you know, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's the other lesson from ranked choice voting and from all my work in politics. Is it, and ranked choice voting in Maine started with four people. It wasn't like we had some big organization and we had a bunch of people telling us that we were allowed to do something. And we just thought it was a really good idea and that it was a it was a solution for the problem that we we're experiencing in the moment. And so that I used my skills that I have gained in politics and worked with, you know, hundreds and thousands of volunteers to get it done. We passed two statewide initiatives. We did two signature campaigns. We fought a battle in the courts. I've seen the inside of five courtrooms. I'm not saying this is easy. This is really hard, grinding work, as you know, um, but it is possible. And so, you know, just like you gave away so many skills to me, I want to give away this, what I think is a solution to the problem that ails us in American politics, which is that we're just, we're just fighting against each other. And we agree on so much more than we disagree on. And we, we deserve 
to have a more nuanced ability to express what what we want to see in our leaders than we do right now. And so, so how do you think ranked choice voting does that? Why don't you do a little okay. bit? Of, let's back up one second, and let's give an explanation. What does it mean to to have ranked choice voting specifically in two sentences? So in two sentences, it's just an instant runoff. Rachel Maddow, the other night on TV, yeah. she yeah. Yeah. ranked choice voting. She called it one, two, three voting. So you go into the booth, your voting booth, you rank your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and on down the list. And it gives you the freedom to vote for the candidate that you like the most without being afraid that you're going to elect the candidate that you like the least. And so in candidates, in campaigns in, in Maine, we have really strong independent tradition in Maine. We have an independent United States senator. We have independents who run, who run viable campaigns. And our campaigns are about, if you vote for that one, it's going to spoil it for this one. And if you vote for that one, then it's really a vote for this one. And there's all this talk about wasted votes, spoiling your vote. And that's what people talk about in elections instead of their ideas. They talk about who's ahead and who's behind and who can win, and it's not a level playing field. So ranked choice voting um, gives you this newfound power to kind of express a nuance, right? Right. Um, so ballots are counted around, and the candidate with the majority wins. So how do you, count, how do, you do the – can you do the balloting by, um, by machines? Can it, it – does that add it? Okay. So it doesn't add That's counting time. No, it's not at all. It's, well, it adds counting time when every single of the 500 municipalities in Maine doesn't have an optical scanning machine. Okay. So for all of the big, for any place that has more than 500 people in their town has an optical scanning machine, and it's just like a scantron, and you just mark it like A, B, C, sort of like you're just filling out one of those tests, first, second, and third. It's very, very easy. 99% of Maine voters who... Um, were able to rank their ballots in this past election. So because we make choices like this every day in our everyday lives, right? If they don't have the everything bagel, then you get the, you know, the onion bagel. If they don't have the onion bagel, then you get the cinnamon raisin bagel. It's, it's right. simple. And, and doing it, so you feed it through a machine. It's called the DS200, and it tabulates the results um, with the press of a button. So who else is, are there any other states currently in, in, that you, you're talking to? to try to bring this to them in for 2020? So I think that the way that this started in Maine, it was specifically great for Maine. We have um, elections where our governor, where people are elected with 35 and 36% of the vote. So then they go on to govern, and they're governing on behalf of 35 or 36% of the people when 60-something percent of the people, 61% of the people didn't vote for that person. So for Maine, it really makes sense. And... Uh, I think that there are other states in the country where this could also make a lot of sense. So you're really, people aren't necessarily running as Democrats and Republicans per se, or are they? Sure. So we used ranked choice voting in the primaries in Maine this year. So in June, we had a seven-way primary, Democratic primary for governor. Uh -huh. And Seven candidates ran, and I, when I went in, I got to rank my seven candidates. As a result, I learned about all seven of the candidates. I'm a Democrat. I learned about all seven of the candidates. Um, I went to different debates. I was able to um, really, you know, really vote for the person that I liked the most and not just for the person who I thought was going to win. Um, it was really interesting how the candidates behaved um, during the campaign. It was a really positive campaign. Because with ranked choice voting, if you're not somebody's first choice, you really want to be their second choice. And so you don't, you know, uh, run a really negative campaign against your opponent. You'd rather say, I agree with this person. I hope you pick me first. But if you don't pick me first, will you please pick me second? And so you have these um, debates where all seven candidates for the Democratic nomination, before the election, were holding up their arms, you know, together. <laughs> so it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Really, really, really cool. So really, the, the really other cool. candidates that run, they're not really affiliated with a party. They're independents. If you have... Well, in the general, yeah, in the general election, sure, yes. you have Democrats, Republicans, Greens, Libertarians, and then just people who are unaffiliated. So they, they're just independent. They're not, they're not connected to any party 
or any ideology. They're just independent. And so um, that is a lot of people in Maine run under that banner. And until now, they've had um, a very tough time competing on a level playing field with the major, um, with, with the candidates from the two major parties. So because they're splitting, the, people say, "Oh, you're just splitting the vote." Right. Right. Think about think about 2000, right? I mean, it's hard to think about 2000. That's right. If you think about 2000 and you think about people could put Ralph Nader first and um, Al Gore second and George Bush third, then Al Gore would have gotten to a majority That's right. most third, right? Because a second choice vote for Ralph Nader most likely would have gone to Al Gore, and we'd have a whole different world. Oh, would, we, would, we we ever, would we ever? Would we ever? Would we ever? Now, wait, so you, you had to go to the courts. Tell me about what yeah. happened and how you ended up going to the courts and then ultimately winning in the courts. So luckily, I was able to work with a team of really talented lawyers. So um, they're, they were from a firm, uh, first a, a man named James Kilbreth from a firm called Drum and Woodson, and then later with a team of lawyers, um, Kate Knox and James Monteleone and Michael Bossi from a firm called Bernstein Shore. And we uh, were challenged many, many, many times for different reasons, mostly by the Maine Republican Party, um, the, the governor of Maine, uh, who was named Paul LePage, said that ranked choice voting is, quote, the most horrific thing in the world, end quote. And so they took us to court in state court. They took us to court in federal court. They took us all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court of Maine. And now there is a, currently a court case pending in United States District Court. We just won um, the, the candidate, Bruce Poliquin, who did not get the most votes, who is the incumbent Republican congressman from the 2nd District, um, has declared himself the winner of the race and not Jared Golden, because he says we use an illegal voting scheme. Um, and so he's challenging us. And it's interesting because it's a Trump-appointed federal judge, his first case. And in, when, when Bruce Poliquin demanded that the election be stopped, and that the, cap, the tabulation be ceased and asked for a TRO. And we went immediately to court and won, and the judge said the election must go on, and that his uh, arguments had no, uh, you know, no basis. Is there a reason why the Republican governor was so afraid of this? I think that in Maine, uh, they are worried that, you know, they, they know how to win an election with 30 Eight percent of the vote, thirty-nine percent of the vote. Maybe they don't have candidates that are appealing to fifty-one percent of the people. Yeah. So, so this, just to be really clear, it's not a, it's a nonpartisan reform. So it's not it doesn't benefit Republicans over Democrats or independents over Republicans or independents over Democrats. It just lets everyone try to get to fifty-one percent of the vote. It lets every every candidate needs to appeal to a broader citizenry to a broader base of people to get elected. And then when they go to power, look look what could happen. They, they, they're able to govern answerable to, to a broader group of us who, if you weren't my first choice, you were definitely my second choice. And isn't that um, uh, better than what has happened a lot, which is that all of a sudden our third choice gets elected or our fourth choice gets elected um, based on this small sliver. So what do you think will happen next? Will there be more people interested in running? Because um, as an independent, uh, it, it, because they don't necessarily, is what you're saying is, you wouldn't necessarily have to have as much money, would you? No. Um, you wouldn't. I mean, money is still the mother's milk of right. politics. That's never going to change. But. Uh, it, it, it changes the dynamics in the race. You know, I watched it happen in the race for the Democratic primary nomination. If you can imagine, what would a primary look like in um, 2020 in New Hampshire, for okay. example, with the Republicans and the Democrats? You know, if you could begin to picture what that would look like, would would you have somebody get elected with the New Hampshire primary with 17% of the vote when the next person got 16% of the vote? You know, you might not. You wouldn't with ranked choice voting, right? You would have a Democratic candidate who was lifted up by more than 50% of the Democratic primary voters in a state. Pretty cool. So it gets, that's interesting because then is New Hampshire going to maybe do this? 
Well, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly up to the people in New Hampshire. Right. To, right, because as, you know, as, a, as states, we're in charge of how we run our own elections state by state. That's why New Hampshire gets to be the first primary in the nation, because they chose that. Um, and then they have a long, proud tradition of it. But how great would that be if we could change the system and adopt a system which would give those candidates even more of a lift going into the general election? to be chosen by that many people as their first or second or even third choice. Like, you know, it's, sure. it's pretty neat. So Maine is the only state currently in the country, correct, that does correct. this? Correct. the first state in the nation to adopt ranked choice voting for federal candidates and for primary. We still do not have ranked choice voting for statewide office in Maine. Um, that's, a, that's a long story, but we'll, we'll get there. We have to amend the Constitution of Maine in order to do that. But in order to get a constitutional amendment, we have to get a vote of two thirds of houses of both both houses of the legislature. Right. So the legislature is controlled by people who are currently in power who probably don't really want to change the system. Um, this is a very much, um, you know, it might be the right thing to do, and it might be what the people of Maine voted for twice. But there are very powerful forces that are still trying to stop it. I still, my head's still going back to what you said before. Of of if we had this in the presidential, gosh, how things would be imagine, very different. Just imagine even in the Republican primary. Yeah. Would would he have been, would, would the president have been able to peel off 16% here, 17% there, 31% here, 20% there, and, and then walk away like he'd won a mandate? He didn't win a mandate. He didn't win 51% of those people. And we need to get back to a system where the majority rules again. You know, and, and, and maybe we're not we quite can, so We can nice. fix the problems, I'm telling you. We can sure. fix the problems in the country if we just open up the system a little bit and, like, you know, reinvigorate our democracy with a better idea. What do you think would be the first thing that would change? Imagine how they would behave towards one another in a debate. Yeah. They wouldn't tear each other down as much as they would, tear, as much as they would say, I agree with you about that, but what about this? Or, you know, just take any issue. You know, we agree about so much more than we actually disagree about. But campaigns are kind of about, you know, this just as well as anybody, they're about kind of finding differences and distinctions and trying to distinguish yourself and say, I'm right and he's wrong. Right. And so this is a different kind of conversation that people have with voters. Like, I really, you know, I am, I am pro-choice and that is someplace where I will never deal um i am uh, it, it's hard to it, it's hard to um talk about there are certain things where i won't compromise right right as a candidate where i wouldn't compromise but there's a lot of places where i feel like i could find middle ground if i were to be a candidate for office so i um, you gather you got together a big coalition right when you did this Sure. I mean, the, the second time around when we had, we gathered, we were able to gather 80,000 signatures in the middle of winter in 88 days with almost 2,000 volunteers. Oh my gosh. So this reform has really, and let me tell you, Susan, it was women. I mean, there was a lot of great men. Well, that was involved. my next question. Who's behind let this? Let me tell you yeah. what. The women got to work in the state of Maine about what they got to work about. And they were not going to stand for, you know, we passed ranked choice voting with the second largest a vote in the history of citizens initiative and then almost immediately just four days after it became law the the legislature and people who are in power in augusta sought to try to change it and and they repealed it they repealed our law completely they wiped it off the book we had a fair and free election and the politicians wiped it off the books because they didn't want it and that's when you and went so to court had, and and well we went to court many many times but yes that time what we did is we did something called a people's veto so in Maine's constitution it gives you the power to change what the legislature has done and so we had to in 88 days in the middle of winter and let me tell you they planned it for the middle of winter sure sure because you know our pens were going to freeze <laughs> so in addition really, to all the body parts right Right, we had one of the coldest winters in Maine. We had a bomb cyclone, but let me tell you, the the people and the women they came out of their houses and they met us in this little shoebox of an office, and we organized from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of towns, little tiny towns all across the state of Maine, this this remarkable democratic effort, 
and we turned those signatures in and we froze the law in place and we used it for the first time on June 12, 2018. And then they made it, we had another election and this time we won by eight points. This time we won by eight points. Amazing. And then we got, we got it and, and we used it to vote and it um, changed, uh, it, it changed the course of American history. A absolutely. So Susan Collins is going to be up in two years? Is that right? Yes. Susan Collins is up for re-election in, in the year 2020. Right. And she is the last remaining Republican office holder in the Congress in the entire Northeast of the United States of America. And she will be running in a ranked choice voting federal election. And uh, a lot of women... Uh, I guess there was a lot of diverse opinions on what she did with this, with Kavanaugh and the Supreme Court. What, are, what did you hear up there with all these women that you have activated? So uh, the women that I activated are Democrat, Republicans, and Independent. So there are a lot of Republican women in our coalition who are interested in um, ranked choice voting and being able to put who their first choice is. And for them, their first choice very well may still be Susan Collins. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, you know, taking off my nonpartisan ranked choice voting hat, I think Susan Collins is going to have a hell of a race um, this time around, not only because of ranked choice voting, but because she is, um, because her vote on Kavanaugh was really, uh, you know, uh, I would say a seminal vote. You know, I posted on the internet that her vote for Kavanaugh is indelible in the hip, in the Hippo campus that, for me. That's a great that, that's a great line. But um, has she talked at all about ranked choice voting? Has she said she's in favor or opposed? She has not said whether she's in favor or opposed to ranked choice voting. Although she is a member of the main Republican Party, and the main Republican Party has um, and has has fought ranked choice voting tooth and nail. Has the Democratic Boston Party done it? Time. Has the Democratic Party embraced it or no? For the most part, the Democratic Party has embraced it. It's part of the Democratic Party's platform. It has been for a long time before I even started doing work on ranked choice voting. They, the Democratic Party endorsed ranked choice voting in Maine. Um, and uh, there are, you know, it's not uniform, but our new governor, Janet Mills, has said that as one of her first act as governor will be to propose a constitutional amendment so that we can use ranked choice voting in um, our races for governor and for state legislature. So we look we look forward to that and i um, very excited that we have a woman governor of Maine. Absolutely. Kara, um, I just have to say it's so nice to see you. Um, it's, you know, I, there's, a, there's a number of women that I've that I've mentored and put my uh, arms around here in Virginia for the last 20 some years. But it's great to reconnect with some of the women that were young pups uh, back when I was a younger pup um, around the country. And the great things you're doing. You're married. You have two beautiful sons. Thank you. You, you sound so happy and you're doing such great things for women, Thanks. for our country. Yeah. And I'm so yeah. proud of you. So now comes a time in the show that I have to say, Carol, you know, I do this funny, funky thing where I, where I roar. So I have to yes. say to everybody, thank you for watching Platitudes. Find your roar. So Kara, are you ready? I'm Hear ready. me roar. Go.